The installation of an OE-sized crankshaft created a problem. It certainly made the piston protrusion more consistent cylinder to cylinder, as it was supposed to be. But it raised the Cylinder 7 piston protrusion higher, although the same as other OE motors. For me though, I've got one valve pair that's inconsistent with less recession, and it wouldn't matter if it's over Cylinder 7 or 2. Referencing Zeb's rebuilt motor specs, that will incorporate a Colt Stage 2 cam. You can see the target piston protrusion is under spec, targeting 26 thousandths. And other builders do that too, either shaving the tops of the pistons or buying pistons manufactured that way. This is done not only for higher lift cams, but also for engine blocks that have been decked. You take 5 thousandths off the deck, you need to have the pistons compensating. In Colt's literature, they state that even a Stage 2 cam is a drop-in, in almost all cases. When talking to Jeff at Colt Cams about how much clearance, he said to me that he likes to see 30 to 35 thousandths at a minimum, and you can check that with clay on top of the piston. I've never been comfortable measuring clay. I've tried. And especially with this little of clearance. As of spring 2020, Dynamic Diesel has a new cam spec, and now they give numbers for protrusion and recession that make it easier to check if you're good to go. For both their Stage 1 and 2 cams, they say piston protrusion should be no higher than 32 thousandths. But they do say normal factory specs for recession would be okay, and 22 to 24 would be ideal. Kill Devil now sells their own private label cams, as well as Colt cams. For Colt cams, they repeat what Colt says, check the clearance. For their private label camshafts, they state the same optimal values as Dynamic Diesel. The numbers are two thousandths of an inch relational, two thousandths lower for the piston, two thousandths less for the valves but not with any possibility towards the wider factory values. The problem for me, Colt has higher lifts than either of these two offerings. So why is this important? This illustration shows a cylinder on its power stroke. The piston is pushed down by the burning fuel. As it starts to rise and compress, the exhaust valve opens to let the spent gas out and it needs to be fully open to get all of it. But we get to the point where the piston chases the valve, and we don't want them to touch. That bends the valves, bends push rods, and breaks rocker arms. So the valve has to get back home fast enough. Once the crankshaft starts to pull the piston down on the intake stroke, the intake valve now chases the piston. And like the dog chasing the car, we don't want the valve to catch the piston either. Again, bent valve, bent push rod, or a broken rocker arm. At the top dead center, the piston protrudes over the engine block deck in this design. There's not a lot of clearance with aftermarket performance camshafts when the valves are open. There's much more room or tolerance with the stock cam. I'm going to show how I degree a camshaft, or in this case, a crankshaft. For just measuring valve clearance, it's not necessary. 
but it's good if you want to see the details. And it's probably the only time I'm ever going to do a video that has the opportunity to show how to do this. I gave up using a degree wheel a long time ago. I've never been happy trying to get a reading between the pointer and the dial. But it's not that bad for what needs to be done for this situation. It's more important when you're trying to degree a cam, altering the timing. I've been using an inclinometer. It's easy to set up, and I've gotten what I feel are more accurate readings. A simple bracket from the lumber store works well, along with the dial indicator, which you're going to need for any measuring. When setting up any degree measurement, the hardest situation is to find the top dead center. Piston travel per degree is longest at 90 degrees to vertical, and minimal at top dead center. It sort of dwells there. I plotted out the 6 O's travel per rotation, and you can see that in the graph. There's very little piston travel for about 2 degrees before and after zero. But at 25 to 30 thousandths away, the piston has a lot more travel per degree. So it's best to use a value like 30 thousandths or more away from the top dead center to zero out your degree dial, or in this case, inclinometer. And although this calculation looks complex to find the zero point, it's not as you will see. I'm setting the top dead center as best I can. I back away to about 30 thousandths of an inch and reset my zero point on the dial. Again, a reasonable travel rate. This inclinometer has a magnetic base. After backing up, I'll rotate the crank in a clockwise direction to get to the 30 thousandths mark, which is under the true top dead center. I'll take note of that angle. Next, I'll continue clockwise past the point where the piston rises and past my zero set point. Now rotating counterclockwise, I again go to the point I zeroed out. About 30 thousandths below TDC. This change in direction compensates for any bearing clearances or other factors and I take note of that degree reading. Subtracting the smaller number from the larger one, I take the result and divide by half. This gives me the value I need to rotate the crankshaft to set for the true zero degrees of top dead center. So 7.1 degrees subtracted from 9.7 results in 2.6, which divided in half results in 1.3. We'll be doing this again if you're lost. With the 6.0, we do have a shortcut. We could use the timing gear pin, which I used when setting the crank in place. Although there is movement, depending on how close your pin or drill is to the 0.236 inches, or 6 millimeter, or letter B drill bit. I have none of those, so I'm using a 1564ths drill bit that has clearance for this example. Depending on your force, you can vary the degrees, but you can also hone in on a value. So how does this compare to my other method? If you look at the smaller size, non-resettable degree value, using the pin results in 1.1 degrees. The piston measured degree value is 1.3 degrees, so 0.2 degrees variation. And how much is the piston moving at that point? 
Remember, it's the lowest movement per degree point, a dwell area. I'm measuring the actual valve movement to hit the piston, so I can directly read how much clearance I will have. But even if I was going to use the clay on top of the piston method, I'd still have to do the following. Use a solid lifter and adjust for zero clearance or lash. To adjust, you need an adjustable push rod. It's easy to gut the existing hydraulic lifters. You could even do this and just put them back together if the lifters were going to be reused. But you need to put the plunger back in the same lifter. You can fill the cavity with flat washers, but I like to use a bolt and a nut to adjust to the point where I can just refit the snap ring. You could buy adjustable push rods to do this, but I'm just going to take two of my used push rods and modify them. At worst, you could buy two new push rods to replace them. It's still cheaper. The push rod gets cut and I cut a groove into the main body. The outer edges get deburred with a file, and the inner edges deburred with a chamfer bit. I tap the body with a 6 by 1.0 millimeter tap as deep as I can. The same is done with the top of the push rod. I double dotted threaded rod and jammed it into the push rod top. I then measured how deep the rod would thread into the push rod body, marking it for reference. And then cut the threaded rod to that depth. The groove cut allows me to hold the body with a screwdriver while I turn the top, taking up all the slack when the lifter is on the base circle of the lobe. It's important that the lifter is on the base circle. Ninety-six point five. When I first did this with the old crankshaft, it was just brute force against two 80-pound springs. It worked, but there's a better way. My way of doing this for the video is to call out the degree reading, and then take three readings to make sure they are correct. 91.6 And with the brute force method, recording them is the only way to observe a good reading by yourself. 88.9 This was done with cylinder 3, which was my problem child with the original crankshaft. With the new crankshaft, my cylinder 7 is my highest protrusion, and mating it to the 18,000s exhaust valve recession. With my old crank, I had much lower piston protrusion, so it wasn't an issue. So here are the goals I've set out to achieve. Of course, measure the valve clearance of cylinder 7. This time I want to index off the piston of that cylinder. This would remove any variation of crank grinding indexing. And I don't expect that with this crankshaft, since it's OE. And I want to use a better method for pushing the valve downward. I'm using the same gasket as I'm going to use when assembling the motor. You could also use a used gasket if you know it's the same thickness. I install the adjustable push rods in the cylinder I'm going to measure. The solid lifters are installed only in this cylinder. The cylinder that I'm going to measure gets the full rocker arm and bridge setup. The other cylinders only need the rocker arm base plates to mimic a full installation.
and I'm going to reuse the original head bolts. I'm torquing these down in steps using the typical install pattern, but the torque steps are different than standards. But for this measurement, it should be irrelevant. 175 pound torque is a workout. The push rods are adjusted so there's no clearance, but you have to not over adjust them either. This was an easy error when I tried to do this with lightweight valve springs. I added extensions to my dial indicator so I could measure directly off the piston. This is easy to do with this motor as the injector is 90 degrees to the center of the piston. I dial in the inclinometer as I showed earlier splitting the difference. I'm using the OTC tool 303-1170 that you would use to compress all four valve springs to remove rocker arms or push rods. The injector has to be removed. There are only small areas where you could have a dial indicator sit on the bridges to measure the travel. I'm using a one quarter inch socket wrench so I don't develop strong forces on the valves and the pistons, which potentially could bend the valves. At the end of all this, I will be rechecking if my valves hold a vacuum to determine if I bent any valves doing. Seven point oh. Positive eleven point two. 
So the intake valve moves 41 thousandths before touching the piston, which is plenty of room. But it was the exhaust valve that had the least recession. For the exhaust valve, I just made this lever to use off the edge of the rocker box. The oil rail mount sits lower, so it will pull down. A stud is used rather than a screw, so I don't wear the aluminum threads from doing this over and over. A large hole allows the lever to pivot, and its contact edge to the rocker is rounded off. The exhaust valve with 18 thousandths recession does make the target of 35 thousandths. For just checking the clearance between the valves and the pistons, we didn't need an accurate setting of the degree wheel or inclinometer. It could have been degrees off. It's not critical. It's the travel that's important, and on the graph if it shifted to the right or left, it wouldn't matter. But it provides knowledge of where you are so you're not hunting all over the place. I've gathered a lot of information on this spreadsheet. I've got piston movement, valve movement, valve to piston clearance, and I can use the data in a table to know the clearances I have with my other cylinders since I measured the protrusions and recession while the heads were off. I also took the data and made this table. Like anything I do, it's complicated. The red line highlights the cylinder I just checked with direct measurements with this replacement crankshaft. The 18 thousandths exhaust valve is within the 30 to 35 thousandths range given to me by cold cams, and I show all the other piston and valve measurements. I have two measured calculation which is the relative difference to cylinder 7, my highest. I also did the same with the valves. In the first set of calculation columns, each cylinder takes the piston to valve clearance, subtracts the piston differential, and then adds the valve differential. That results in the clearance for all the other cylinders individually. 
In the next set of columns, I'm calling this the cam grinders factor. In their optimum situation, both Dynamic Diesel and Kill Devil use 30 thousandths for the protrusion and 20 thousandths for the recession. The 2 thousandths difference between the two really doesn't matter. It's relative between the pistons and valves. A simple calculation makes that 10 thousandths. Using my measured and calculated values in the columns, it shows an inverse number. As long as you are under 10 thousandths, you have enough clearance. This is going to take some time to sink in. My worst case doesn't quite fit those two companies' statements. I would have to have a piston protrusion of 28 thousandths to match my 18 thousandths valve recession. Or I would have to have a 19 thousandths valve recession to match my 29 thousandths piston protrusion. 10 thousandths difference. I did my own factoring calculation in the last columns, taking into consideration the gasket thickness, just in case the gasket thickness is different than a stock Ford head gasket. So that factoring is gasket thickness minus the piston protrusion and adding the valve recession. For that calculation, you need 42 thousandths or larger if you're using the cam grinder's numbers of 30 for the pistons and 20 for the valves. If the head gaskets were 62 thousandths, my worst case cylinder would be well above this factor value. Let me go back to when I asked Zeb what his facility does when building a motor for the Colt Stage 2 cams. They have taken a more conservative approach, which you would expect for a company that has to stand behind any engine build. Their piston protrusion target is 26 thousandths, and set the valves at a minimum 25 thousandths recession. Using those values, my factor calculation method shows a 51 thousandths minimum. My motor is within Colt cam values that were given to me but not as conservative as Dynamic Diesel, especially when considering that cam has less lift, and not as conservative as Zeb's facility does. If you made it this far, thanks for watching.